Good evening. I'm Jonathan Kay from the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester. And I have here several colleagues from the Rheumatoid Arthritis Faculty for Room Now. Uh, it is Saturday, November 7th, and we've all spent a day, the second day of ACR Convergence 2020, sitting in our offices at home, watching our computers. And the, there have been a number of interesting presentations. So I have here David Liu from Australia, Eric Dine from Baltimore, Sheila Reyes from the Philippines, Jeff Sparks from Boston, Richard Conway from Ireland, and Moral from Cleveland. So we have representation from both blue states and red states and uh, allies of the United States. So uh, we've all been attending the ACR Convergence. Uh, David, let's start with you. What abstracts piqued your interest today? Well, there was one other poster for that I found uh, quite interesting. It was from Leeds uh, and Paul Emery's group. And they've done over time a lot of work in the space regarding um, clinically suspect arthralgias. So these patients with musculoskeletal symptoms, inflammatory sounding arthralgias um, who are ACPA positive. And the question has come about, uh, I mean, over a whole series of different things, what should we be doing in these patients? Well, um, this looked in particular at the value of plain film x-rays. And that might not sound like a big deal, but I guess we shouldn't be doing more investigations than we need to. I think we've, we're thinking more about over-investigation. And then also really thinking about, yeah, how does this change our management? So they looked at x-rays done in these patients to see whether they predicted um, predicted uh, clinical synovitis in the future. So essentially, we're able to predict what might look like uh, the progression of inflammatory arthritis in the future. Uh, and what they saw firstly was that um, only 4% of that overall cohort of clinically ACPA positive, clinically su um, suspect arthralgias had erosions. But more importantly, uh, the presence of erosions didn't predict whether a patient would go on to develop an inflammatory arthritis or not. So that's really challenged uh, my thinking about what to do with these patients. I think we often feel a little bit vulnerable. We, we know that we probably shouldn't treat them. Uh, we we're not really sure what to do about with them. And perhaps sometimes we order an x-ray out of desperation as not knowing what to do. And I don't think that necessarily adds anything at this, at this point. There was another, I think it was a poster that came out of uh, Daniel Alataha's group in Vienna that looked at patients who had erosions and joint space narrowing. And they looked at a cohort of patients from Vienna, over 700 patients, and they found that joint space narrowing proceeded the development of erosions and that seropositivity and seronegativity had nothing to do with uh, progression. Uh, they also found that patients with baseline damage were more likely to progress. That finding in itself, it's not terribly novel, uh, but the fact that joint space narrowing precedes erosions suggests that cartilage damage might be a process either independent of or possibly related to uh, the bone loss that you see uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, Eric, how yeah. about you? So I, I was just gonna add on to that. I thought that um, that poster was interesting with um, looking, looking at those patients with, with the bone erosions because I mean, it was only 4% of the patients. So the number was, was 17 patients. So, I mean, one of my takeaways from that was just that if you have, um, if you have arthralgias without synovitis, even if you're CCP positive, there were just so few patients in that group that it's pretty reassuring that they're not likely to have erosions and you should get the radiographs. And particularly, I think 70% of them, 65% of them were in the feet. So making sure you're, you are imaging the feet if you're gonna do images, but it's pretty reassuring that so few of them had erosions. I, I don't know, um, you know the, the finding that, that you can't really predict with it just because the number was so small. I think it's harder to interpret, um, you know, moving forward, how to treat those patients. Sure, the point that you make about uh, looking at the feet is very important. There are patients that have no erosive change in the hands and wrists, but have erosions in the feet. So always get those foot films uh, when you're working up your patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Sheila, what about you? Yeah, um, well, uh, basically, it's uh, we've all been in interested in the same abstracts uh, on biomarkers. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, uh, aside from that, aside from the joint space narrowing and the x-rays, um, 
There are also interesting abstracts on rheumatoid factor using the RF titers. And one particularly that piqued my interest was that about the anti peptidyl um, arginine deaminase antibodies, the anti PAD antibodies, where they saw a third of patients that were at risk for RA and a third of patients with clinically suspect arthralgias were reported to have these antibodies. And so we see here possible impli um, implications uh, as a predictive tool of um, these antibodies. So uh, we'll, I'm excited to hear more about that. And again, we see here how there's an increasing trend toward focusing on the identifications of patients at risk for disease progression and who would benefit from early intervention. Um, I'd also like to add that there was the session on difficult RA, uh, difficult to treat RA, which was equally engaging, um, which mentioned or talked about ILD, refractory disease, and liver disease. So now that that three-letter uh, term ILD came up, let's turn yeah. to Jeff Sparks. Uh, uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to not talk about ILD, and I'm actually going to talk about an abstract from yesterday. I was moderating yesterday, and so this morning, the you know, beauty of a virtual meeting, I could basically attend as if I was there. So uh, I wanted to talk about what I thought was one of the highlights, which was uh, DMARDs and incident dementia risk within RA patients. I mean, I think this panel would all agree that RA is particularly interesting to study, given how inflammation is important in you know, every organ system. Uh, and how it can tell us about how the pathogenesis of other types of diseases. It's also very interesting to repurpose our drugs for kind of different reasons, even though we're prescribing them to treat uh, joint pain. We, not, we all know that there's probably systemic inflammation, there's inflammation in other organ systems. Uh, so this was led by Dr. Sebastian Satui and colleagues. Uh, it was a Medicare database, so really obviously big numbers, and they really looked at drug classes, biologics versus conventional synthetic DMARDs, uh, and pretty remarkable uh, reduced uh, hazard ratio for incident dementia risk. Obviously, it's a, it's a claims database study, so it's not uh, you know causal. There's obviously more work that needs to be done, but I think this is a really novel path, both for our patients as well as the general population, about how um, our drugs might affect neuroinflammation. Since it was a claims database, they weren't able to assess the effect of these drugs on inflammation in individual patients or even across the population. It's interesting to speculate that perhaps chronic inflammation drives amyloid formation. We know that uh, amyloid deposits in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I wonder if there might be some increased amyloid formation, SAA, in these patients that's being suppressed better by TNF inhibitors than uh, by conventional synthetic DMARDs. It'll be very interesting for someone in neuroimmunology to pursue the topic of trying to work out a mechanism. Uh, perhaps some animal models will be relevant. That's why so, RA leads the way. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Richard, how about you? Yeah, I, I found a couple of uh, interesting posters in the real world uh, data session. And the first of those was by Dr. Movahadi and colleagues from Toronto. And they were looking at time to discontinuation of patients on either tofacitinib or TNF inhibitors, um, either as monotherapy or co-prescribed metotrexate. Um, so coming back to what was talked about in, in the great debate and, and what should be our, our first line biologic in some ways. Um, and what they found was that uh, tofacitinib, it didn't seem to matter in time to discontinuation whether you were on metotrexate or not. Whereas with TNF inhibitors, uh, time to discontinuation was longer um, if patients were co-prescribed metotrexate. Um, and the second very interesting uh, uh, poster I saw was from Dr. Dalal from Brown University. Um, and they were looking at patients with rheumatoid arthritis, elderly patients, so over 85. Um, and they found that 85% of those patients in the first year after they were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis did not start on a DMARD. And to me, that, that's quite a scary thing. We've... 85% of this population not an appropriate treatment for the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, be interesting to explore further why that might be. Absolutely, and try to come up with interventions to hasten the referral of patients for appropriate DMARD therapy. Morale, you're, you're muted. All right, 
slides. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, I was really excited about Abstract 0952, which was recently actually just presented at the five o'clock hour, 5.20 p.m. by Dr. Pooja Khanna of the University of Michigan. It's titled Reducing Immunogenicity of Peglodicase or the Recipe Study with Concomitant Use of Mycophenolate Mofetil in Patients with Refractory Gout. It was a phase two double-blind randomized control trial, and its primary objectives were to assess the feasibility and efficacy of MMF to achieve a serum urate level of less than six at week 12. It also had another primary outcome of uh, assessing the incidence and type of adverse events potentially associated with MMF. And the results were actually really intriguing in that it did show at week 12 uh, reduction in serum urate in 19 of 22 of the patients in the MMF case arm. So 86% in the MMF arm achieved the primary outcome at week 12 comparatively to the placebo arm, where only 40% met that outcome. Even more so, they stopped treatment with MMF at week 12, and thereafter, they saw still a sustained benefit maintained at 24 weeks in the MMF arm. So then the question becomes, were there any changes in the um, in terms of the adverse event profile. And actually the estimated rates of adverse events were comparable between the two groups. And even more so interestingly, they saw a reduction in the number of gout flares every month in the, MMF, in the MMF arm. So I think this is potentially practice changing. It's a small sample size. So this data should be validated in a larger study but it's really exciting stuff. Yeah, absolutely, that's a big problem uh, with use of that drug. Uh, Peglodocase in treating gout, uh, the potential immunogenicity and loss of efficacy. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's an interesting study. So uh, no one has mentioned seen. I think uh, the plenary abstract today, we don't have to go into it because uh, I think uh, Richard filmed an individual uh, discussion of that, uh, that presentation and I did as well. And perhaps we have a third. So if you go to room now, uh, you'll be able to see several discussions of that plenary abstract. So we can probably avoid uh, discussing it now, but uh, I'd like to bring up a, a post or oral presentation that was given by Elisabetta Siakcha from Cospitalis' group at uh, the William Harvey Research Institute in London. Uh, as almost everyone knows, uh, Pitalis' group has has divided rheumatoid arthritis uh, into several groups based on synovial biopsy. And what uh, Elisabetta did was she looked at network uh, analysis to work out uh, networks of protein interactions in each of the different subtypes. She then subtracted from those networks the common features so that she had differential networks uh, for each of the three different pathotypes. And then she was able to come up with a way of associating uh, response to treatment with conventional synthetic DMARDs uh, with these various biomarkers. This is very similar to the uh, commercially available uh, tool that's been developed by Cypher, uh, which is a genetic profile that predicts non-response to TNF inhibitors uh, and potentially might save money by choosing which patients should not be treated with a TNF inhibitor so that you can pick patients uh, who will respond. It would be very interesting if this work from uh, the Pitsalis group could identify patients who might respond inadequately to methotrexate early on before waiting for a six month trial or a four month trial. Uh, and you could start biologic therapy or other agents either in addition to methotrexate or instead uh, in that group. So using this kind of uh, non-biased uh, machine learning to understand networks uh, in different pathologic subtypes of rheumatoid arthritis might lead to a clinically useful tool. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the exciting bit about this is that we're getting to the point where we uh, um, previously, I guess we thought about it phenotypically and we've got a whole bunch of diseases which we label as rheumatoid arthritis. Then we start getting to this deep phenotyping and then something which is actually potentially meaningful by the bedside to be able to have a, have a tool where we can try and unravel that a little bit more. Uh, at the moment, I still feel like we're a lot of the time guessing in terms of what the response is going to be. So to be able to have another further step 
Uh, I mean, those diagrams are beautiful today. Absolutely. Uh, I sat in on the animal model session, the oral presentations at the very end of the day after Tony Fauci's lecture on COVID-19. And Jenny Stavra, who's a junior faculty member in our department uh, at UMass, gave a presentation about the effect of Schnurri 3, which is a gene in mice uh, that seems to suppress osteoblast function in an animal model of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and what she found was that by using small inhibitory RNA to suppress Schnorri 3, she was able to restore osteoblast function and through uh, linkage with osteoclast development, suppress osteoclast function. So interestingly, there's a, humans have a Schnorri 3 gene that's about 80% homologous to that in mice. So there might be an opportunity to try using an adenovirus vector to introduce an inhibitory RNA to downregulate Schnurri 3 and perhaps increase bone formation and through coupling decreased bone destruction in rheumatoid arthritis. Still not ready for prime time, but a very interesting concept introduced in the animal model session. So any other abstracts that uh, piqued uh, anyone's interest today? There was an abstract that uh, Bill Robinson presented about uh, fine specificity of uh, autoantibody, which predicted response to abatacept uh, and methotrexate, as I recall. Eric, did you review that abstract? Yeah, so that was, uh, it, it was interesting. They looked at exactly the fine specificity ACPA showing that you can use them to help um, predict therapy that those patients had a better response on on dual therapy with abatacid and, and methotrexate compared to methotrexate monotherapy alone in in you know all patients were were zero positive RA in that group but specifically if we if we're looking at these fine specific, fine specificity I, um, I'm trying to recall exactly what they specified which um, ACPA they were looking at and um, you could see that you can use this to help predict outcomes as to how patients are, are going to do. So it's just uh, incredible to think about that we might get to the point, you think about in, in myositis, we're so specific with which antibodies and, and the phenotype based on that and what, what drugs we use as a result of that. You know, this is just an indication that, that patients with, with this phenotype or with this marker, maybe they're the ones that should be on, on a dual therapy or they should be on a certain therapy. So we're really getting to personalized medicine now, uh, even more so this year. Uh, I listened to the Hinch lecture this year. Uh, Gerd Burmester from Charité in Berlin gave a very nice historical overview, a tour through the development of treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and I would recommend that session highly to those of you listening to this podcast or this uh, video on, on Room Now. Uh, Gerd really showed the development from the early days when Hench and Kendall uh, first pioneered the use of compound E uh, to treat rheumatoid arthritis in 1948, up through the development of oral uh, biologic equivalent drugs, the targeted synthetic DMARDs, uh, and talked about all of the people uh, in rheumatology uh, who contributed to these developments. So a very nice historical overview. So as we're nearing the end of the time for this panel discussion. Uh, I thank each and every one of you for participating and the panelists. And uh, please go to Room Now for more information to see individual faculty discussions of uh, presentations. And please come back tomorrow when we will reassemble to review tomorrow's uh, day at ACR Convergence 2020. Stay safe and well. I'm Jonathan Kay for David Liu, Eric Dine, Sheila Reyes, Jeffrey Sparks, Richard Conway, and Morales. Uh, good night.